Today, we learn about Sulawesi, an island in Southeast Asia that's home to some of the most unique and fascinating species on the planet. From the bizarre-looking babirusa, which looks like a deer mixed with a pig, to the malio bird, which lays eggs in volcanic sand, Sulawesi is definitely a treasure trove of just incredible creatures. In this episode, I invite Shirazade, a local from Sulawesi who has founded an NGO to help protect the local wildlife and help communities build capacity and be stewards of their natural resources. Let's jump right in. Welcome to the EcoChat Podcast. In each episode, we chat with experts in conservation, animal welfare, sustainability, or environmental science to learn how you and I can make a difference for the planet. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Hey, Shira, how's it going? Hey, Sam, it's great. So we're going to learn about Sulawesi today. And I personally, I've heard of Sulawesi, but I don't really know much about it. So can you start off by introducing us to Sulawesi? Mm-hmm. So Sulawesi is one of the 17,000 islands in a country called Indonesia. And for those who may not know about Indonesia, so Indonesia is part of Southeast Asia. It's located between Australia and Asia continents. And fun facts about Indonesia that we are number four in terms of the largest population in the world. So after China, India, and also USA. And Sulawesi is the largest island exactly in the middle part of Indonesia. It's one of the five big islands, and it's exactly below the Philippines. It feels like for me, Sulawesi is like the Madagascar of the Asia. So the island is home to many of these animals and plants that you can't find anywhere else on Earth. We have, for example, Babi Rusa which literally means deer pig. And for the male pigs, they have this tusk that continue growing, like protruding the upper jaw, and which is, looks like a deer, but they actually pig. Yeah, for those of you on YouTube, I'm going to share some photos of what a babirusa looks like, but it's basically a pig, but with a lot of tusks and horns on its face. And it just looks very unique and prehistoric. It's kind of like a pig mixed with a dinosaur. Mm-hmm. So Babirusa is endemic oh, to Sulawesi. Endemic meaning that, yeah, it can only be found in Sulawesi. And it lives in the tropical rainforest. And what's fascinating about it, it really likes going to a salt lake or a mud flat within the forest. So they look like a, a buffalo that just playing around in the mud, but also lick the minerals around the salt lakes. Interesting. Any other unique or iconic species besides the babirusa? Oh, yeah. Sulawensi also has maleo bird, or in the scientific world, we call it macrocephalon maleo. And macro means big and cephalons means hat. It literally shows or it literally suggests that Malio bird has this giant bulb on top of uh, their hat. And they look like a chicken, but in a, in a forest. They will go in pair from mountains to beach locations or in an area where there is a hydro, hydrothermals. Well, it's very hot and they will lie their eggs there and they will just leave it and two months later the maleo egg will hatch and then the bird can just leave it by their own so with chickens the mom take care of their kids right but then with maleo birds the the maleo bird chick just uh fledge and live by their own very independently so the maleo bird it's basically a chicken with a horn on its head which lives in the forest and it goes down to the beach to lay eggs, is that correct? Yes, exactly. <laughs> you you summarize it really well. But I don't want to under, undermine it as a, as to describe it as a chicken, but I think <laughs> something yes. maybe uh, help, help you guys to imagine. I'll post some photos of the male bird on YouTube as well. So anything else? Any other cool or unique species in Sulawesi? 
We also have tarsier, which is the tiniest and the only entirely carnivore primates. So they eat on lizard, insects, and even snakes. And in Sulawesi, if you go to like different parts of the island, you will find different tarsier species. You will find different primates. And even if you go from mountain to mountain, from lake to lake, you can find completely different a community of animals and plants. So Sulawesi is just extraordinary in terms of their biodiversity, in terms of the animals and plants within it. When you say from mountain to mountain or lake to lake, does that mean like each mountain or each lake has their unique set of species that cannot be found anywhere else in the world? Yes, exactly. So if you go to Mountain Tampotica, for example, you will find through or rats A. And then if you go to other mountains, which is, can be nearby, they can have another species of rats or like rat B. Interesting. So if that rat A goes extinct on that mountain, then they're pretty much extinct from the rest of the world. Is that correct? Yes, exactly so. You get it right. Okay, got it. Any other unique species that you'd like to mention? Um, I will say I personally like bats. <laughs> those flying uh, mammals and especially what we call flying foxes. And these are the largest uh, fruit-eating bats in the world. And Sulawesi has a lot of uh, fruit-eating bats. And for me, it's fascinating because we have the bats that can only be found in Sulawesi. And within Sulawesi itself, we have tiny, tiny islands in front of the mainland. And on that tiny island, for example, we have talaud flying foxes, which is a bat species that can only be found on those island only. So, yeah. yeah. It definitely sounds like a treasure trove of just a lot of biodiversity, a lot of unique species that can't be found anywhere else in the world. Yes. What about the landscape? What's the geography like in Sulawesi? Yes, Sulawesi has such a diverse landscape. For example, if I take an, uh, locations within the central Sulawesi, we have, have tropical rainforest, but we also have a tropical savanna. So in tropical savanna, it's very dry and very hot. It looks like savanna in Africa, but there are trees over there. And But we also have cactus. It's something that if you go there, you won't believe that you are in a tropical areas because how dry and how hot it is. And then not so far from that, we have a tropical rainforest, as you can imagine. And then after that, we have uh, beautiful oceans, of course, the sea, sea grass. And then we're also well known to be part of the coral triangle meaning that we have such a high diversity of corals in our oceans and just exceptional biodiversity in terms of marine life. So we have that expanse of huge diversity in the terrestrial system or in the land system and also in the uh, marine and even freshwater system. Sounds like a very rich and diverse landscape. Yes. Are these natural areas facing any threats? Yeah, so I, I think for the Sulawesi biodiversity face different type of threats. Um, uh, for example, for the past uh, 20 to 30 years, we have lost almost 20% of our forest cover. And it's mainly due to expansions of agricultural lands and also for mining mining for gold and mining for nickel. So if if anyone of you here drive an electric car, the battery of your car will probably use nickel that is sourced from one of the areas in Sulawesi because we have almost 25% of nickel reserve in the world. So expansions of agricultural lands and also mining for gold and also notably for nickels are one of the major drivers of the forest loss in in Sulawesi, meaning that these forests are the habitats for the wildlife that I mentioned to you. And on top of that, besides the forest loss, we also have hunting 
for commercial trade. And these are trade for bushmeat and also trade for pet. So hunting and forest loss are kind of the biggest main threat for the mammal species on Sulawesi. Oh, interesting. So if you have an electric car, then your battery, at least the nickel component, could likely come from Sulawesi? Yeah, the, off, off the record, Sam, there was, there's this uh, new uh, news, actually, and coverage that shows many of the nickel, com- nickel mining company in Indonesia are owned by Chinese companies. And this Chinese company that supply the battery for a lot of electric vehicles worldwide, including Tesla. If you have a, if you drive an electric car, there is a high chance that your battery source nickel from one of the RAS in Sulawesi. So you mentioned mining and agriculture are the two main drivers of forest loss in Sulawesi. Mm-hmm. So we covered mining, that's mostly for nickel. What about for agriculture? What are the main crops that are produced in Sulawesi? Yeah, so it's very different landscape. Uh, so if you compare to Kalimantan and Sumatra, the agricultural lands is expansion or that the conversions is driven by oil palm expansions, for example. But in Sulawesi, it's kind of different across the landscape. And given the fact that we have a very steep terrain, so it's very hard to find that large expanse of land for a large-scale monoculture. But in West Sulawesi, for example, we do have oil palm, but in many parts of Sulawesi, these agricultural expansions is for uh, cocoa, for coffee, for uh, coconut, for corn. So something more that are commonly recognized as the drivers of agricultural uh, expansions in the forest. So it's way more diverse. All right, let's transition into your conservation work in Sulawesi next. But before that, I just wanted to, first of all, understand your story and why you chose to focus on Sulawesi. Yeah, the easiest answer to that is because I'm from Sulawesi and this is a, a place where I grew up, uh, basically. So I was a daughter of a farmer's who have experienced economic hardships. I still remember vividly that there were times we only eat instant noodle or rice with salt or mixing eggs with flour so we had enough for me, my brother, and my sister. But at that time, I I feel that being outdoor and being in the nature was something that made me really happy despite of those hardships. And it's been my dream that this is the land that I grew up. This is the land that I connected with nature in in a moment in my life that that's uh, really hard. So I determined to give back to to the land to Sulawesi, and of course over time I learned that oh the biodiversity turns out very exceptional. But what I I've done so far in Sulawesi was mainly driven by my uh, personal determinations to, to giving back to the land that I grew up with. I just want to dig a bit deeper. So you started in a rural area with a lot of hardships, and I assume you also didn't have much access to education or to learn English at that time, right? And then fast forward to right now, you're doing a PhD at Berkeley. You started your own NGO. So yeah, how did you jump from where you started to where you are today. Tell me your full story. Yeah, I, I didn't know English at all. I learned it from that Irish boy band called Westlife. <laughs> I don't know whether it's uh, like famous right now or not. But uh, studying and being in nature are the only thing that I could do at the time. And I know in order to to improve my well-being, to improve, to have a better chance in my life, I need to study really hard. And I used that opportunity to apply for university in the in the capital. And then after that, I went back again to Sulawesi, working for two years. And then I applied for a scholarship in the U.S. And I went for a master degree there. I went back again to Indonesia and also to Sulawesi to work. 
And then after three years, I apply for scholarships and right now doing PhD here in, in Berkeley. But yeah, it was a, a long story, but I, I learned English word by word and also just study every single lesson because that's the only tools that I have to, to gain a better opportunities. So the lesson there is to learn English. Listen to Westlife. Yeah, <laughs> really to learn English. I I know. Yeah, need need to survive in the world that uh, that put English as if it's our uh, language, right? <laughs> Definitely. And you make it sound so easy. I know. <laughs> I would imagine learning English to the level where you can do a PhD at Berkeley is no easy task, especially you know given your background, given limited resources. So I'm curious, what kept you motivated or driven to keep pushing yourself yeah. to the level you are today? Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a great point, Sam. I also have, I'm lucky because I have a mentor and my mentor really guided me for 10 years and it's, it's one of the main reasons for me to be, to be in this position. So I remember I wrote something, what I want to do for research, send it to her and she will send it back to me with all the corrections and including English. So I learn it one by one, what is like my error, how to use singular, plural. Oh yeah, all those all those uh, tiny things about English for years. Yeah, I don't know if I managed to make it sound more difficult. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> all right, so let's jump into your project now. Tell us what you're working on, what's your mission, and what you're trying to solve. Uh, so I built this uh, small NGO called Progress in Sulawesi, starting in 2018. At that time, I didn't have that clear intentions that, oh yeah, I want to build an NGO. I know at the time my intention only that, oh, I want to continue my master research. I wrote on my dissertation all of these recommendations to protect nature, to protect Sulawesi biodiversity. And then there was a moment that I realized, wait, Sarah, so who will read your dissertation? Who will read your scientific publication and do your recommendation? I can wait for 50 to even 100 years and have no one to do what I recommend. So at that time, I decided, well, I guess I'll be the person that do the recommendations. So I decided to continue my master research and then work with the community to start protecting uh, bats, the animal that I told you previously that I'm very interested in. So from bats... We work with the local community to monitor one of the colony that is hunted for bushmeat. So the hunters will go to the village with uh, with bats and ask the villagers, "Oh, can I just take your your bats?" And then the community was like, "Oh, okay." They don't even know that they can say no to these hunters because they don't really understand what what does having bats mean to them or what are the importance of bats to their community or to the ecosystem that they depend on. So, yeah, that's kind of the start of it. And over time, we have and we gain trust and relationship with other collaborators worldwide. And from bats, we protect tortoises. From tortoises, we protect couscous, that is the marsupial, uh, with a pouch that lives in uh, above the trees, but what yeah, I'm... they're very cute. Yeah, very cute, like very boy boy, <laughs> very round. But I would like to to show you that it's actually a process, uh, Sam. Like I know that from the beginning, I want to give back to protect nature in Sulawesi, or I want to give back to the community where I grew up with, but. I didn't really know how, but I know that I can continue my research in Sulawesi and start to build that connection with the local community. So that the intention was just 
oh yeah, I want to work together with the people to protect the bats in their area. And over time, I realized that there are other animals in Sulawesi like tortoises or the cute couscous that never really get that conservation attention despite their being uh, endangered. So my mission was to work together with the local community as the agent of change of or the champions in their own, own uh, areas. And then I envisioned that with them, we can protect together all these animals that never really get that uh, attention that they deserve. I really like what you said there because I feel the same thing, that a lot of quote-unquote scientists or researchers in conservation, they just publish all these scientific papers saying we should do this, we should do that, but they don't actually go out and execute it and try to influence change. Yes. And just publishing these scientific papers does nothing. Mm. So I really appreciate that you are actually proactive. And like you said, instead of waiting for decades for someone else to do something about it, yes. you've decided to be the person to actually do it. And so to recap, you created this NGO and your mission is to work with local communities in Sulawesi mm -hmm. to protect the biodiversity there. Yes. And you mentioned a few species. Um, there's the flying fox, the couscous, the tortoises, and you mentioned they are endangered, so you're working to protect them. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, first of all, why are they endangered in the first place? Yeah, so the bats, the flying foxes are are quite meaty. <laughs> and also the cute couscous are quite meaty. So for the bats and the couscous, they are hunted uh, for consumption uh for bats in particular, they are hunted for a commercial trade, for commercial bushmeat markets in the north. And for the tortoises, they are hunted for being a, a pet because they're also really cute. Those tortoises, they have a black and yellow on their shells. So they're traded uh, for, for pet in Sulawesi and also to outside Sulawesi. So hunting is kind of the major threat for all of these animals. And on top of that, there is the forest loss and also mangrove loss for bats that crippled their habitats. But mainly, we work on the hunting issues for these animals. So excessive hunting and poaching for the bushmeat and the pet trade industry are significant threats to these endangered species that you mentioned, right? Mm -hmm. So walk us through how you worked with the local communities to educate them on being more sustainable mm -hmm. or more aware of the value of the natural resources that they have. Yeah, I think that this is a great question, Sam. So so we combine what I call science-based and community-based approach in conservation. So I worked together with uh, my collaborator, Baanim. I'm more in the nerd side, in the scientific part, and then she's more in the community part. So first, I train the local youth or the young generation in the village to do the bat monitoring works together with me. And at the same time, I also engage with the local fishermen that will go to the bat uh, place with me because this bat island is actually located one hour by a small boat from the nearby village. And they're the ones that accompany those outside hunters to go to the bat island. So what I do is that I engage the local youth in the village and also the fishermen to be a part of our ongoing works. And that's more in the scientific part. And the community part is mainly to build the connections with the local people. So, for example, we had a storytelling project from school to school and then from village to village to educate about uh, the importance of bats among children. And we have movie screening. We also have a lot of uh, activity that's done together with the people, for example, um, tree planting or waste management. But more importantly, we allow the community to see us just as their friends. 
So at first, they will say no to hunters because they want me, they want our team to still be on the island, to still be around them in the village because they like us, not necessarily because they understand that the bats are important. And I know it's a process. So over time, they realize that, oh yeah, bats are important for the forest nearby the village that actually provide them with clean water and clean air. And bats, I don't know whether you, do you know durian, Sam? Oh yes, I love durian. <laughs> yeah. So bats or the flying foxes are important durian pollinators. And durian is one of the most beloved fruits in Sulawesi in Indonesia or in Southeast Asia. It's also part of the conversations to in to increase and build that intrinsic appreciations toward uh, the bats. So it's kind of a process for five years in a way together with the community to understand the bat populations, to understand the service, but at the same time is to build connections, trust and relationship with the people, which I think is key for that uh, more sustainable and everlasting uh, conservation programs. Well, I'm sure you understand that it's really hard to change a person's perspective or mindset, let alone a whole community. So I was wondering if you have any tips on how to do this or what was the main thing that helped you transform these communities and actually encourage them to act on what you're educating them to do? Uh, I think me and Ba'anim and our team don't really try to change people's mind. We try to connect with their heart. And that's kind of the points of our approach because when we are connected by heart, we can easily understand each other's minds and probably affect each other's mind. So for for us, I don't want to see it, it sound like cheesy, Sam, but it's truly, it's, it's not like we do education, we do storytelling, we do all these community engagement activities. It's not necessarily to to educate and to change people's minds, but most notably is to first connect from heart to heart. And then it will open up to have a more thoughtful conversation and how bats can be important to us. So that's kind of our tips and our way. I'm just trying to understand the details a bit more and dig deeper. So you mentioned that connecting with people heart to heart is a powerful way. So what exactly does that mean? I mean, let's say I'm like the the village chief Uh or I'm a classroom of students and your goal is to connect with me heart to heart and show me the value of flying foxes, for example. How exactly would you do that? Yeah, this this is a a great point. The easiest thing is that I will, I stay in the village. Yeah, I will just stay uh, in the house in that in your village and I will interact you daily and we're going to start from that. When I started this, Sam, I live on that island where all the bats are and then the local community are very surprised and think I'm a crazy woman (laughs) because that island doesn't have a people because they have millions of mosquitoes so people don't want to live on the island. So when they realize that there's this small girl living on the island for weeks and then keep going back for months, they become so curious about it. And then from curiosity, they become uh, kind of respectful in a way. Oh, what is this about bats that make this little girl want to live on that island with millions of mosquitoes? How she could sacrifice her life? <laughs> just to understand those bats. So from that curiosity, they start to open up. And that's the moment that I can have more conversations with them on bats and also about their life. I can tell them about, oh yeah, I study. This is this is why I like bats. 
And then they will also tell me about what they do in their life. Oh, I fish. I go to the forest to harvest something. Or, yeah, it's starting with a more conversation. Um, it's not really that mechanistic process. It's more that this fluid, very reflective experience in a way try to understand each other. So yeah, live in with live live with the people. This may be the the straight answer. Good. Got it. So you started this NGO, and now you're working with these local communities, and you're living with these local communities and trying mm-hmm. to connect to the people heart to heart to educate them on the value of these endangered species or any other natural resources that they have. What would be the ideal outcome that you would like to see from this? Yeah, I think. We envision that the people is empowered to be the heroes in their own RAS, to be the local champions of protecting the animals. And of course, not only about the people, but we would like to see that the populations of the animals are increasing. So for example, with the bats, we started five years ago, Sam, with only 300 bats roosting on the island. And then over five years, we've seen that the community has been empowered. They are brave to say no to the outsiders. And as a result, the bats started to coming back. And there's point and throughout the year that there is almost... 50,000 of bats now roosting on the island. So for me, it's the kind of outcome that we dream of. Not only that the people and the community is empowered, but then you could see it that the animals start to return to the, to the area. I really like the word empower. Like you're empowering these people to be their own heroes for the local biodiversity. I know we already touched on this a bit, but do you have anything else or any other examples to add Mm -hmm. on how exactly you would empower these communities to be more proud or appreciative of these species that they have? Mm. Yeah, so I will take another example for our couscous program. So couscous is a marsupial, it's like kangaroo with a pouch. But couscous not live in the ground. They live on top of the trees. And at the border of Sulawesi and Philippines, there was this island called Talaut. And in one of the islands is where my organization's working on with the community to protect the Talaut couscous. We went there and then we set up this pride campaign which basically aim to nurture the sense of pride of the community of having this animal. And the easiest way was that they were so proud when they knew they are the only island in the world that have these animals. For them, it was astounding that, oh, this couscous only in this area? So it's it's actually a source of pride because for this community, maybe there's not so many things that they can be proud of, but having this animal and it turns out the attention of the world directed to them just because of the animals is a it's really instilled that sense of pride of having the animals. And over time the attitude of, oh, I want to hunt these animals to eat them, it gradually changed into, oh, I don't want to eat this animal again because I kind of proud of them, of having this animal around the area. And by having them, we have this attention from other people. So you mentioned the flying fox. There's a tortoise species. There's also the couscous and a few other ones that you're focusing on protecting through your organization. So I just wanted to clarify, why exactly did you choose to focus 
on these species in particular. Yeah. Just want to make sure that it's couscous is not the same couscous as a food in, in India. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not the rice. So it's spelled C-U-S-C-U-S. And yeah, it's super cute. It looks like a teddy bear mixed with a koala. Right. Just very cute and fluffy. But you got, you, you got it right. So I think the common theme of these animals that they are endangered. They are clearly threatened and at the brink of extinctions. But what's dire about them is that they don't receive that conservation attention, meaning that no one study them, no one know about them, and no one even try to protect them despite that they're already endangered. So what I and my team called them, they are threatened but overlooked species. They need our attention, but they've been neglected. So that's kind of species that we target using our approach. And they're not really that well-known, charismatic, protected species. So that's what we aim for. We work on species that are considered non-charismatic, species that are not protected legally. And most of them distribute mostly outside protected areas. So if you look at the challenges the opportunity is to work with the people because, yeah, what else you can do? They're not protected by law. They also don't distribute within protected areas. So this is kind of our approach and in a way of targeting species that are endangered but have been neglected so far. Yeah, that makes sense. Just to recap, so these species are not very charismatic or well-known. So it's not like a tiger or a panda where it's very iconic and a lot of people just know about it. Yeah. The species you're focusing on, they're often neglected and their habitat is not protected. So Mm -hmm. they especially need our attention. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. And and many of the species that we know on Earth are... We don't really know about them, but we're even losing them without us being aware of it. So that's kind of the point that I'm I'm trying to make with our strategies, Sam. For other people, they may not be charismatic, but for me, they're kind of like charismatic in a way. But yeah, I, I think that there are these animals that that really need our attention and they're just intrinsically valuable. So your organization named Progress, that's P-R-O-G-R-E-S, aims to work with the local communities in Sulawesi to protect these endangered, neglected species that you mentioned. Tell us about the day-to-day activities or operations of your organization. Yeah, that's uh, Sam. Uh, so we are like a conservation organization that is expected to work on animals a lot so we we do a lot of research in regards to wildlife but to be honest 80 percent of our funding and 80 percent of our activities involving people so we invest and comprise our activities in relate to capacity building and relates to outreach and storytelling project and a lot of about it are the community engagement activities and i think this is uh, important to highlight because we we don't necessarily focus only on the animals, but we mostly care about the people. And the aim is to build that such uh, intrinsic appreciations and also motivations to protect nature and animals. And many of the activities are, of course, related to the to the people. Yeah, I really like what you said there. Just from my conversations with other people in, you know, frontline conservation efforts, it's really only like 10 to 20 percent science. And the rest of it is working with people and getting them just intrinsically involved or motivated and building capacity. Yeah, for capacity building, we work together a lot with the young generations. So... Enhancing their capacity in terms of research or even as simple as what does conservation entail? 
what does it mean and what does research uh, is about and how to do research. So as simple as what is research, what is conservation, how to get involved in it, what is the meaning of protecting animals, what is it important to them. So more in that kind of capacity because we envision, I don't want to be there almost in my entire life, Sam. My definition of success is if I can just leave the area, <laughs> like our organization is not needed anymore. And I want to see these young generations that are involved in our capacity building and our conservation activities are the one that they will run and even lead that conservation program in their own areas. So that's an example of the capacity building activities. What's your definition of a successful, sustainable community where your organization is not needed anymore? For me, it's the, I know that, for example, my approach and our organization still have a lot of homework as um, in, in terms of helping directly in the welfare of the people, in terms of the social and economic aspect. But for me, that the sustainable part would be the community can exercise, can still have their livelihood, but think about and consider about nature. For example, they do fishing and then because they understand about the importance of nature, they will do, they will have fishing practices that will not use bombing that will distract the coral reef, for example. So for me, that the success is reflected in a way community do their livelihood in a sustainable way. So if they do fishing, they will do it in a sustainable way, not using bombing, not using the poison. And if they do farming, they will do it in the proper locations, they will not expand it further and further inside the tropical rainforest. So I think the embodiments of that understanding of nature and animals are reflected in their uh, way of living. So here's a theoretical question. Money and greed are very powerful drivers of action. So you mentioned, for example, nickel mining and agriculture are two of the biggest industries in Sulawesi. So let's say a nickel mining company arrives at a local village um, and proposes to develop their area into a nickel mine for XYZ amount of compensation. And this sum of money or whatever benefits they propose is, is huge to these villagers. Of course, it's quite irresistible to them. Uh, so my question is, how do you empower these people to think critically and actually weigh out the value of their natural resources versus the value of this development of this nickel mine, which is often a one-time thing and it's not sustainable long-term, uh, but they will have immediate benefits. How do you get them to critically weigh this out? Yep. It's a very, very difficult question <laughs> for... For me, Sam, I I don't against that that some sort of development, but I against the way it's it's being undertaken. Yeah. For example, like yeah, this is very hard for me to to conceptualize it, Sam. Yeah, because for example, I I'm not the ones that against nickel mining if it's something that is very necessary like I don't mind with it but what I disagree is that the process of doing it for example if they open nickel mining they have this environmental impact assessment do they do it right the environmental impact assessment do they really do the public consultation with the local community do the local community get that enough incentive? Not only in re in regards to money, but also in regards to like impact, present impact and future impacts. 
many there's the study on in Morawali where the fishermen are impacted by the tailing from the mining the mining they couldn't do fishing anymore as part of their livelihood so for me that development or like nickel mining stuff is something inevitable in the current context but we can work together in a way improving how it's being practiced yeah often these development projects that come from foreign corporations they don't even consult or compensate the local people adequately yeah and these projects are often just a one time thing that cripples their natural resources and yeah. it's not sustainable long term like you can't reverse the impacts once the area has been developed or destroyed mm, and my stand stand for that that i'm i'm not against tough development i'm not i'm not that such a hardcore as <laughs> radical it's like no no but i i think it's just inevitable and what we we can do something to improve in a way how we do our development it's not something that oh yeah i come in and this is money you should agree with that so yeah Yeah, that makes sense. I would imagine there were times when you wanted to give up, like, oh, I'm just one person. How can I empower an entire community? Yeah. How can I save a species or how do I even start an NGO and handle all the legal paperwork, etc.? How yeah. do I form a team? So, in those moments when we want to give up, we we think this task is so difficult, so formidable. What are some tips you would recommend to help keep pushing ourselves towards that goal and not give up. Yeah, I think one tip is to recognize and to remind yourself about the values that you have. For example, I value compassion and working with the animals and working with the people just give me that motivations to do what I'm doing. Um yeah peace is hard <laughs> and then being far away is so hard so i try to still connect i ask my team to send me picture of the bats <laughs> so that that's kind of how i survive it to stay connected with the cause even though it's physically far away i'm i'm trying hard to connect it uh, virtually nice okay. nice As you mentioned before, science is only a very minor aspect of conservation. The bulk of your work at your NGO is actually interacting with people and effectively communicating with them. Then, so, how did you learn this skill or how can our listeners learn to just, you know, communicate or interact with people effectively? I think for me it's just to to get your out uh yourself out there and don't be to in social media a lot <laughs> because if you are on in social media a lot you will your skill to socialize with people just vanish eventually train yourself to be out there to meet strangers to engage in the cultural activities with diverse people it really help uh, to hone your skills and interacting and also connecting with people And I think I want to add to that your previous question, uh, Sam. The journey to protect animals, to protect nature, or the journey to do what you believe in or what you're passionate about is, of course, can be a very lonely journey. But what I believe and what make me can get through those hardship is that. It's not a single hero works. It's a collective action. So you remember, you always have the people that believe in your cause, believe within your passion. So you're not alone. So reach out to people. Reach out to people that probably have the same interest with you, the same passion with you, and work on it together. So it's a collective action. Never thinks that is only you in the world that will that care about this. There are way more people and 
they are way kinder people than you would expect. 100% agree on that. There's billions of people on this planet, so I'm sure you're not alone in whatever goal you want to achieve. So, yeah, like you said, just get yourself out there, start joining events, start interacting with people who are working towards similar goals or who have similar interests, and you can kind of team up with them or compound each other to keep pushing forward. So on that note about teaming up, I have a question about starting an NGO. So I've read mixed advice in regards to starting an NGO. Some say it's too saturated and there's way too many NGOs out there. So starting one would just dilute the resources or donations. And they claim it's better to team up with an existing NGO, which already has the resources and the infrastructure built. So you've obviously started your own NGO. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. Like, should you start one or team up with an existing NGO? Or when would it be reasonable to start your own? I think you should just you should do whatever your heart tells you to do. What when I started this Sam, I didn't even imagine that this will be an NGO. I legalize it as an NGO more because of the administrative purposes. <laughs> For example, I need to get the funding and my donor need to be uh my organizations to be a legal entity because the reporting about financial things. So that's why I legalize it as NGO. I believe that we need uh, diverse actions. We need, yeah, small NGOs. We need people that work in a big NGO. There are advantages and disadvantages for each of the actions. But I will just say if you want to build your own NGO, try to do a small thing first. Don't think about that legality of being NGO first. Just tr- just try to do one activity that uh, you're interested in and see over one to two years whether you really need to make it as an NGO. Yeah. So try it first. Yeah, go out there. Not in a way that, oh, I want to build NGO and I build NGO and then I do this activity. For me, it's more important that you do your activities first, do what you're passionate about, and then think whether legalizing it as an NGO is really necessary. Or if you want to collaborate with people, for example, or if you just want to uh, advocate it as part of a program of a big NGO. Yeah. Yeah, I really like your point. So do what you want to do first. Work on your goal first. And when the time comes for the need to register it as an NGO due to admin or logistical reasons, that's when you should worry about starting one or not. Yeah. So it's time for us to wrap it up here. I find your story very inspiring. As you mentioned, you started in a rural village with economic hardships and you learned English listening to Westlife, and now you're... Do you know Westlife? Yeah, we... yeah. I lived in Malaysia for a while, so oh. <laughs> they had it on the radio a lot. Uh. So, yeah, right now you're doing a PhD at Berkeley. You started your own NGO. You're working with the local communities to build capacity and to be more sustainable. So you've definitely come a long way. From your journey so far... If you could distill it down to three main lessons or messages you would like to share with our audience, what would that be? Yeah, for me, first, look around you if there is opportunity to volunteer. I think as you gain more experience, you realize what kind of gap in society that you could fill in with your passion or with your good intentions to contribute. And second, I would say help to be the voice of this nature and animals. You can share the information of any of the outreach material for from organizations in your social media, for example, on your Instagrams or on your Twitter. As as easy as that. And then the last one, I would say uh, be an active advocate of this voiceless creature, whatever your position will be. For example, if you work in a, in a company 
that has nothing to do with the environment. Look, look at the opportunity if they have like CSR program, mm-hmm. the corporate social responsibility program, and maybe you can make a su- suggestions in terms. Oh, this is an activity that probably we should do for the community, or this is an activity that we can do for a certain nature or animal somewhere else in the world. And I will also suggest that whatever your dream will be, whatever your position will be, act on kindness and compassion. I would say that moral responsibility to protect animals, to protect nature, to work together with the local community, to do something important, are you don't need to be a conservationist to do it. You don't need to be scientists to do it. I think you can be whoever you want to be, but if you have that kindness, if you have that care about these animals and nature, you will find a way how to help them. So, yeah, for me, just just start with volunteer and also try to think about to be an active advocate for nature and animals in whatever your job is. Nice. Uh, Follow-up question to that. You mentioned sharing content on social media and being an active advocate of nature and animals. Do you have any tips on what types of content to share or how exactly can you be an advocate? Yeah, for example, in social media, there are a lot of conservation organizations that love to do awareness campaigns. Um, For example, International Day of Rhino, International Day of Elephant. So I like sharing those information on my Instagram story or on my Twitter in order to to celebrate and increase the awareness of these animals are endangered and need our attention. And then from those publicity, it will show the opportunities of, oh, well, the easiest is you can donate to this or conservation organization. So by even just sharing it, you can and let people know about this issue and maybe encourage them to help the organization through donations or to any of our volunteering activities. And then for the active advocate, I will say uh, it can be reflected in a way you vote your your leader. For example, in Indonesia, we're going to have uh, presidential elections. Think about who's the candidate that's more likely to support any pro-environmental policy, for example. Voting is our power, and we want to have leaders that are conscious about environmental issue or conscious about things that we're passionate about. So I think it's also one way to be an active advocate for nature and animals. Don't elect leaders that only care about our economy. <laughs> Maybe us just elect leaders that uh, speak about forests or speak about animals. So we actually have the power. Perfect. Well, it's been very delightful chatting with you, Shara. Please give us a handoff to where we can contact you, learn about your work, or any other resources you would like to share. Yeah, so you can visit our website in progresswawc.id. You can also look on our Instagram, and you can also connect me on Twitter at Sarah Gosboing because I like sharing about nature and animal stuff. Great. I will put all these links mentioned in the show notes or the YouTube description below. Shara, thanks again, and best of luck with everything. Yeah, thank you so much, Sam, for this uh, very delightful opportunity, and thank you, everyone. That's it for today's episode of EcoChat. All the resources mentioned will be available in the show notes. If you enjoyed it, please consider sharing and leaving a rating and review in your favorite podcast platform. It really helps the algorithm to show our channel to more people. And with that, we'll catch you next time on EcoChat.